HMAS Australia was part of the three-ship class of the indefatigable class battlecruisers of the 1908 estimates, being essentially an enlarged version of the preceding invincible class. Australia and her sisters epitomize Admiral Jackie Fisher's idea of a battlecruiser, being heavily armed, fast, and lightly armored, although somewhat changed from the lead ship indefatigable. In June 1913, she was commissioned as the flagship for the Australian squadron and arrived in Australia just a month later and was in the South Pacific when the First World War kicked off. Australia was requested by the Admiralty to search for the German East Asia squadron, prompting them to leave the Pacific as Australia pursued them. Although unsuccessful in her efforts, she joined the battlecruisers under Admiral David Beatty in January 1915, becoming flagship of the 2nd Battlecruiser Squadron, where she would collide with her sister New Zealand in April of 1916 in dense fog causing extensive damage to the ship. Because of that, missing Jutland. Following the war, Australia headed back to her namesake and was scuttled in accordance with the terms of the Washington Naval Treaty. The indefatigable class has an interesting beginning. As you see, there was a great controversy over the 1908 building program for capital ships. Intelligence suggested that the Germans had stepped up their building program for 1908 to four capital ships, with evidence pointing to them building another four the following year. Meanwhile, the government under Prime Minister Asquith had only given enough money to build two capital ships, as the Sea Lords and Director of Naval Construction did not muster strong enough arguments to be given the funds for more ships. The press reacted rather harshly to this lack of building by the Royal Navy. It started to stir up agitation from the general public, with things reaching a fever pitch in the winter with people demanding an emergency building program be put in place at once. The original program called for one battleship and one battle cruiser. The cutbacks by the Prime Minister's Liberal government were partially offset by the stir of patriotism in Australia and New Zealand, with each offering to pay for one dreadnought-type ship, making their feelings heard about cutbacks as Germany continued to build up their fleet. Admiral Jackie Fisher quickly diverted the funds to build two new battle cruisers, with New Zealand's donation being a gift to Britain, where HMS New Zealand joined the Royal Navy. At the same time, HMAS Australia joined the Royal Australian Navy and would be available to the Royal Navy if needed. Australia and New Zealand, since it was decided that they were going to be built later on than indefatigable, they had some modifications, and they are 1. Belt armor terminated 60 feet short of the stem and 55 from the stern. The extremities closed by bulkheads. 2. The belt was increased from 4 inches to 5 inches of breast A and Y barbettes, and from 2.5 inches to 4 inches of baft Y barbette. 3. Upper section of the belt bulkhead was reduced from 3 inches to 1.5 inches forward, and from 4.5 inches to 4 inches aft, but the aft bulkhead was situated much farther aft than an indefatigable. 4. Main deck armor extended to within 55 feet of the stern instead of terminating at Y barbette. The lower deck forward and aft was increased from 2 to 2.5 inches. 5. Spotting and signal tower was sighted over instead of behind the conning position, and the thickness of plating was increased from 4 inches and 3 inches into 6 inches and 3 inches. This coming from R.A. Burt's British Battleships of World War I. I want to discuss the armor a bit more found on the ship as it's an interesting subject. I think R.A. Burt describes it best. Admiral Fisher's dictum, speed as armor, was never better exemplified than in this class. Their extremely poor protection made them vulnerable as capital ships. Some of the changes in the indefatigable class as compared to the invincible class are that the belt abreast A and Y turrets was reduced from 6 inches to 4 inches, while the right forward on the belt was reduced from 4 inches to 2.5 inches, with the 2.5 inch thick armor carried to the stern. The main deck armor of 3 quarters of an inch outside the forward bulkhead was suppressed. The main deck armor over the magazines was increased to 2 inches. The lower deck in the forward section was increased to 2 inches, while the aft section was reduced to 2 inches. As for the particulars, she was laid down in June 1910, launched in October 1911, and commissioned in June 1913. It should be noted that these figures are for the class in general, and the changes that I mentioned previously apply to Australia. The ship had a displacement of 18,750 tons and a deep load displacement of 22,080 tons. Her machinery consisted of 31 Babcock and Wilcox boilers, giving steam to Parsons direct drive turbines which drove four shafts, giving a design shaft horsepower of 43,000 and a top speed of around 25 knots. While in her trial, she managed 55,880 shaft horsepower and a top speed of around 27 knots. Her armament consisted of eight 12-inch 45 caliber guns and twin turrets, one forward, one aft, and one on either side of the ship in wing positions. The secondary battery consisted of 16 4-inch 50 caliber guns, Rounding out the armament, she carried four three-pounders, five machine guns, and two submerged torpedo tubes. As for armor, her belt was six inches amidships, 
4 inches at the end, and 2.5 and inches fore and aft. Bulkheads of 3 and 4 inches forward, 4.5 four and, and 4 inches aft. Barbettes of 7 inches, a conning tower of 10 inches fore and 6 inches aft. While the turrets had a face thickness of 7 inches and 3 inches on the roof and rear. After commissioning his flagship for the Australian squadron, Australia went to Portsmouth, where King George V knighted Rear Admiral Pate, who was in command of the Australian squadron. Then in July, Australia, accompanied by the light cruiser HMAS Sydney, sailed from Portsmouth to Australia via South Africa and arrived in Sydney in her namesake country, where the official transferred the flag from HMAS Cambrian to Australia's flagship of the Australian squadron was done. This moment in the port of Sydney was something special for the Australians who were there to witness it. To take from the page on Australia on the Australian Navy's website, Port Jackson was no stranger to Imperial and foreign warships, but the battlecruiser, both majestic and foreboding at the same time, was something different. She was the embodiment of the Commonwealth sea power and unquestionably superior to every other European warship in the Pacific. Arrangements to have the flagship visit many of the principal Australian ports was being developed. Calling in at Albany, Port Lincoln, Hobart, Glenagall, and Melbourne, and steamed as far north as Townsville to show off the new ship and what their taxpayer dollars had gone to. Much like her sister New Zealand, Australia was extremely popular with her namesake nation, even being the subject of several songs and even a movie titled Sea Dogs of Australia. However, in July, after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the subsequent July Crisis, the British Admiralty requested that HMAS Australia search for the German East Asia Squadron in the Bismarck Archipelago on July 30th. One of the reasons why it was important for the Royal Navy and the Dominions to have a battle cruiser in the Pacific is because the German Empire had many colonial possessions in the region that were guarded by the Tsingtao-based German East Asia Squadron under the command of Admiral Maximilian von Spee, who had several cruisers under his command, including the unarmored or light cruisers Emden, Leipzig, Nuremberg, and other combatants like the armed merchant cruiser Prince Eitel Friedrich, but critically, he had two powerful armored cruisers, the Scharnhorst and Neisenau, with a battery of 8.2 and 5.9 inch guns that would be hard for any other British force in the area to match, besides the flagship of the Far Eastern Squadron, Monmouth, which although 3,000 tons heavier than her German counterparts, could not hope to match both of the German ships at once. In late July, Admiral von Spee and his squadron were spread out across the Pacific and were not concentrated. On the 27th, von Spee was at Ponape when he received the message from the German naval staff of Austria's ultimatum to Serbia, and strained relations between the dual alliance and the Triple Entente. Samoan crews will probably have to be abandoned. Nuremberg has been ordered to sing Tao. Everything else is left to you. Von Spee realized that it was not practical to send Nuremberg to sing Tao, as the cruiser was in Honolulu at the time. With the possibility of a joint attack from the British and Japanese, Von Spee countermanded Berlin's orders and told Nuremberg to meet him at Ponape. Meanwhile, at Tsing Tao, his supply ships were loaded and escorted by Emden, sailing on July 31st. Meanwhile, as I mentioned, Australia was ordered to go to the Bismarck Archipelago. However, she needed to coal first, and went to Sydney, and then by the 12th of August, she was patrolling the St. George's Channel, which in this case refers to the water between the eastern coast of New Britain and the west coast of New Ireland, southward to the Cape St. George. By the 5th, when Britain had declared war on Germany, von Spee had a decision to make, what his next move was going to be. Nuremberg had reported once arriving that day that the British China squadron was concentrated around Hong Kong. Although not superior to von Spee's force, it wasn't the only enemy in that direction. Both North and South were out of the question because they would most likely run into a superior force, including the Japanese or fortifications. This left the East remaining. As Robert K. Massey puts it in Castles of Steel, Britain, Germany, and the winning of the Great War at Sea, the East remained. In the distant East across the Pacific, on the coast of South America, there was British trade to be disrupted. Here, there was no Japanese fleet and no British squadron to oppose him. The coast of the Americas, North and South, presented an 8,000-mile stretch of neutral nations from the southern Canadian border down to Cape Horn. Many of these nations would sell him coal. Further, if he continued east around the Horn into the South Atlantic, the important South American trade routes to Europe lay open to attack, and once out into the Atlantic Ocean, he might find his way home to the North Sea. On August 13th, his 53rd birthday, Maximilian von Spee, with his captains aboard Scharnhorst, agreed that they would head east and go to the west coast of South America, owing to the German influence and enjoy better facilities for supply and communication. However, they did decide to send the cruiser Emden in the opposite direction to raid, and her story is rather interesting, but for another time. The first stop for the East Asia Squadron was on the 19th of August as they approached Enuitok. 
Then on the 26th, it was Majeure in the Marshall Islands. As the East Asia Squadron continued on its way to the west coast of South America, Australia and the other elements of the Australian Squadron were hoping to capture German colonies in the area like Samoa, denying the facilities to von Spee. This little spree of capturing German island colonies continued into September as on the 9th, they captured Rabaul. Following this, another capture of an island and a German ship. On September 15th, Australia left Blanche Bay with HMAS Sydney and Melbourne en route to Albany to escort the first contingent of Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. However, on the 17th, they were recalled to assist the French armored cruiser Montcalm in covering an expedition to German New Guinea, owing to the suspected presence of Scharnhorst and Eisenau. German ships were actually not near German New Guinea and were closer to the French colony of Bora Bora. Von Spee and his squadron had covered quite a long distance, where Massey describes the scene. Admiral von Spee's next stopping point was the isolated British-owned Suvorov Island, 500 miles east of Samoa, but finding that a huge ocean swell prevented coaling, he continued another 700 miles to Bora Bora, an island of the Tahiti group in the lush French society islands. Bora Bora, with its volcanic mountains, dense foliage, and settled population, was a welcome change from the flat, sun-baked, deserted coral atolls that they had left behind. Scharnhorst and Eisenau anchored off Bora Bora, displaying no national flag. French authorities, believing the visitors were English, sent out a police officer in a boat flying the tricolor and offered help to the British admiral. The policemen met only German officers who spoke English or French, and the subterfuge continued as other representatives of the local government came on board to present a huge bouquet of flowers, pass along war news, and in response to gentle questioning, describe the defenses of Papete. The Germans paid with gold for coal, pigs, poultry, eggs, fruit, vegetables, and several oxen slaughtered immediately. In the afternoon, as the cruisers weighed anchor, a large French flag was hoisted in a farewell salute from the shore. In reply, the Germans politely raised the German naval ensign. After that encounter, von Spee continued on to Papete, the port and capital of Tahiti, where he planned an armed landing as they had been warned of his arrival. The French had taken to the hills, set the coal he could have used on fire, and were attacking him with coastal artillery and a gunboat which was promptly sunk. Not necessarily needing the coal, the German East Asia Squadron continued to the west coast of South America, where in about a month's time, von Spee would meet and destroy Admiral Craddock's North American station to destroy those ships under his command. Following such a disaster, the British Admiralty redoubled its efforts in trying to hunt down von Spee, bringing the battlecruisers invincible and inflexible to the South Atlantic under the command of Vice Admiral Sturdy to lead the hunt for the German squadron, while Australia was ordered to the American coast in case von Spee headed north, and on November 29th she met with Japanese cruisers. After Coronel, von Spee decided to raid Port Stanley in the Falkland Islands, leading to the demise of his squadron at the hands of Sturdy and his battlecruisers. Now, I'd like to cover the events of the German East Asia squadron in more detail in the future. I figured I'd give some context to why Australia was running around the South Pacific. Moving fully into the rest of Australia's history, in December 1914, the Royal Navy called for Australia to come to the United Kingdom as they needed more battlecruisers to match the growth of the high seas fleet. So Australia began the journey to the United Kingdom, going around South America and reaching the Falkland Islands on January 1st. While going through the Magellan Strait, she bent a propeller on a rock and was forced to stay for repairs, meaning that once she arrived later that month in Portsmouth for a refit, she missed the Battle of Dogger Bank. Following her refit, she joined the battlecruisers in the Firth of Forth near Ross Scythe. She became the flagship for the 2nd Battlecruiser Squadron with the overall command of the battlecruisers under Admiral David Beatty. Australia quickly fell into the routine of drills, sweeps, and supporting sorties with the other battlecruisers, with nothing really of note until April 22, 1916. The British were conducting another thrust toward the Skagerrak, the battlecruisers entering a dense fog near the Danish coast. Australia and New Zealand were zigzagging at 19 knots and proceeded to collide. This was not the only collision that day as the dreadnought Neptune collided with a neutral tanker and two British destroyers collided that night. But the damage to her armored belt was so severe that she had to stay in dock until June 1st, and because of that she missed the Battle of Jutland, where New Zealand took command of the 2nd Battlecruiser Squadron. Once returning to service in June 1916, Australia continued her North Sea patrols as a unit of the Grand Fleet until another collision in the winter of 1917, where she collided with the HMS Repulse, causing her to be docked for several weeks, and her generally uneventful patrols continued in the North Sea. This rather mundane patrolling duty was broken up somewhat when she escorted convoys to Scandinavia. In February, the monotony was broken up as Australia provided one officer and ten ratings for the raids on Ostend and Zeebrugge, 
acquitting themselves quite well. Six of them were awarded medals for bravery. Australia was also used for flight experiments, with the ship's echelon turrets being thought to offer better wind exposure and a safer takeoff position than alternative warships, carrying off several successful flights in the spring of 1918. The rest of the war saw more patrols and covering missions for Australia. As the armistice came in November 1918, on the 21st of that month, she was there to escort the German high seas fleet into internment, with each ship taking a German one under custody. Australia was given the newest German battlecruiser, Hindenburg. Following the war, Australia left for home on April 23, 1919, sailing from Portsmouth to Fremantle on the 28th of May for a four-day visit, with a bit of an incident in the city as some of the sailors wanted to delay the sailing of the ship so they could entertain civilian friends. However, they were told that this could not be done, and later reports showed that some stokers had left their post in protest. Twelve men were arrested for mutiny, with only five actually convicted. Finally, she reached Sydney on June 15, 1919, after an absence of 1,775 days. After returning home to Australia, she resumed her role as flagship for the Royal Australian Navy, playing a critical role in welcoming the Prince of Wales in renown the following year. But her time was coming to an end. The Royal Australian Navy spent a majority of its budget and manpower maintaining the battlecruiser, and it was decided the Navy could better allocate its resources, so she was slowly downgraded to that of a gunnery and torpedo school, with a secondary role as a fixed defensive battery. In December 1921, she headed to Sydney to be paid off and put into the reserve, and to comply with the terms of the Washington Naval Treaty, which applied to Commonwealth navies. She was prepared for scuttling. The ship was stripped of equipment, and on the 12th of April 1924, she was scuttled outside Sydney. The Prime Minister, Stanley Bruce, had this to say the night after she was sunk. In the prime of her service, the first great ship of the young Australian Navy was our contribution to the defense of civilization. In her passing, she symbolizes our contribution to the cause of peace. Sacrifice her with a regret rendered poignant by the memory of her great service, but tempted with the hope that the world will see the magnitude of our offering and how we make it. A measure of our practical belief in the principles enunciated at the Washington Conference, which constitute the only hope of a permanent international peace. The passing of Australia closes a glorious chapter in the history of the Australian Navy. We shall never forget that in the eventful days of 1914, when the fate of civilization hung in the balance, it was the presence of Australia, manned by Australian seamen, that saved our shores and our shipping from the fate that overtook the less fortunate nation. Royal Australian Navy no longer had a ship named for the nation. Only a little over a year later, the county-class heavy cruiser bearing that same name was laid down, carrying the name through the next war. The battlecruiser Australia didn't have all of that of an exciting career. Still, it represented a nation's pride in the power of not only Australia, but the British Empire, as they could afford to station a battlecruiser so far from home waters. I know some of my Australian viewers have been wanting me to do a video on a ship from another nation, so I hope I made them happy with this one. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and until next time, my friends, have a great week.